have amazing rates. Uh, it's a routable map, it's not just a display map. And it's life saving, <coughs> right? You probably know all the story about Haiti and how uh, after the earthquake went from that very rapidly to that. A little bit of the history that you might not, you might, might not know. It's the first mapping party. I was in London with a, a guy called Tom Card, and we were just looking at a map, and I pointed at the Isle of Wight and said, why don't we run a mapping party there? Uh, but I think it was actually Tom that came up with that term. Back when the project was very new, we needed some kind of validation to prove that we weren't just a bunch of idiots hanging around in the pub. Um, so we figured we would try and map somewhere completely for some value of complete. Uh, the most obvious thing the obvious place in the, the UK would be to, to find an island because then you have some definition of a boundary that's, that's clear and concise because you know, there's water surrounding you. Uh, so we had a whole bunch of people go down there, and these were the maps that were available beforehand. So this is a out of copyright map, um, which is another important reason why the project started. In most of the world, there are really good maps, but you just can't do anything with them. You can't um, get access to the vector data or go use it for some use case that the government doesn't want you to use it for. So this was out of copyright data. It's 60 years old-ish now, by, I think, uh, of the Isle of Wight. The island's about 30 miles across by 15 north to south, I think it is. Um, and this map is useful in that it shows some of the main roads, but obviously there's been a lot of change in the last 50 or 60 years. So we ran a thing much like this conference where anybody could come along and pay, um, pay for their boards. And we had 30 or 40 people come down uh, from all over the UK and other bits of Europe. And we collected GPS traces because we had no access to aerial imagery. And this is a screenshot of the traces that we had. Uh, the car represents a different person each time. So we had some people walking around the city, some people driving the country lanes and so on. And we spent two days uh, and very rapidly turned it into a map, which was the first validation of the project. Um, even if it's a whitewash that you can't see anything, I can assure you there is map data behind that. <laughs> Color balancing, another problem that should be solved by now. So, um, this year is very much OpenStreetMap's best year yet. I mean, this uh, graph says almost all of it. Um, the, the great thing about this graph, uh, I've showed this a number of times, and every year obviously I get to show more of the right hand side. But typically people like to concentrate on the right hand side because that's the interesting uptick bit, right? But there was a lot of stuff that went on the left hand side of that graph, on the left hand half of it that you don't have to worry about, which is a good thing. Um, but there are lots of amusing stories, mostly involving posts and uh, things like that. So during this conference, someone pointed out probably the 850,000th user will join during this weekend. So if you can all create 20 fake accounts each, I'm sure we'll get yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the recent upticks have, have just been amazing. Uh, this graph. Reminds me of this one, the growth in computability and computer power in the world. Uh, it's kind of detailed in small text, especially for those at the back, so I'll try and describe it. Basically, computer power is going up and up. There's a single Moore's law. Um, the price per unit of computation is going down. And if you project that out and you squint, then pretty soon some interesting things happen. Um, these kinds of exponential graphs tend to bite you in the ass because uh, it's very very easy to predict the near to medium term, but very hard to predict what's going to happen long term. So this particular one shows that hypothetically in about 2023, that's in 10 years, we have enough computer power to simulate the brain. And then very rapidly after that, 2045, uh, we have enough computer power, computable power to simulate every brain that's ever existed because the doubling rapidly, rapidly catches up on you. And there's some interesting stuff behind that. There's this guy from Oxford called Nick Foster, like underdog. Uh, yeah, he's and he wrote this interesting paper a few years ago about PA so much. Compu computability and whether we're in a simulation or not. And he says that yeah. one of these things has to be true, these three statements. The first is, uh, we, essentially, we all have to die before we want to simulate people. Right? There has to be some kind of extinction because it's, it's fairly certain that we're going to have enough computable power to simulate everybody if we want to. Um, secondly, we have to want to do it. Right? So we have to want to go and simulate the people as they existed in some kind of thing. Um, and if, if neither of those are true, we're almost certainly in a simulation because 
there will be so much computing power in the future that you'll be able to simulate so many people that if you're a random individual in that sample, the largest probability is that you're living in the simulation rather than outside of it. Um, which is an interesting perspective on a consumer mailing list space if you're simulating this. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this is a very old, old idea and it goes back to um, shadows on a, on a cave wall. But there are some interesting things you can do because you can try and look for the brush strokes of reality, right, to see whether, whether we are in a simulation or not. A bit like computer games, like Battlefield 3. Are there any Battlefield 3 players? One, see the intersection of OpenStreetMap and Battlefield 3 is relatively small, as you can see. But we should, we should be friends. I've got my game attack and can all the way. Um, but computer games offer a, an interesting glimpse at this kind of stuff because they, they simulate the medium. Right? They don't simulate the near or the far because that's kind of expensive. So here's a screenshot from the game. You don't, t you don't simulate the gun to the point where you could take a screwdriver and take those screws off the, the rifle. And you also, you don't simulate the, the distance because you just make that a picture. And you, the, all the interesting stuff happens in the medium, um, which is very much like reality, right? You start looking out very distant at galaxies, nothing goes wrong. The physics goes weird and we don't know why there's dark matter and blah, blah, blah. We should have found aliens by now. We haven't. Right, that's a bit weird. Those are two interesting indicators that this might all be a simulation. And similarly, if you go from the very large to the very small, physics gets really weird and stochastic for no particular reason. Right. Um, so we're all in a simulation. So have some perspective. RSM is legacy. So as the project's grown. What I've tried to do is give up control continuously and to list some amusing things. I did the data model a long, long time ago. I used to run the servers. I gave a lot of these kinds of talks all the time. Um, I set up the first state of the map and the OpenStreetMap Foundation, which even that I'm not a, a board member of anymore. And as the, the project grows, I have to give this stuff up and allow pe other people to take control. Otherwise, we wouldn't all be here if I tried to run the whole thing, as much as I think I could run it better than anyone else. Uh, <laughs> it's got to the point now with the, the foundation where uh, I'm no longer a board member. I'm chairman uh, emeritus, or as I think Matt told me, I'm chairman emeritus or something. <laughs> um, State of the Map is similarly, I mean, uh, State of the Map Tokyo was really, really good, fantastic conference. Um, I've said this a few times, but they, the Japanese guys made the Germans just look chaotic and unorganized in the way that they <laughs> 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 and it, I, uh, I had no involvement in that, right? So from my perspective, you know, I spent a lot of time on the first Sotom, less on the second, and so on, to the point now where uh, I didn't even particularly speak at that conference. And that's a real challenge and something I try and work towards is, is building something that can do without you. Um, try and make your job irrelevant, uh, which is hard, but uh, it pays off. Similarly with uh, the foundation. So the foundation has this um, tension. It has a tension between whether the foundation represents the data or whether it represents the community, because you do two different things depending on which is your priority, right? And they're both very important. But if you want data in the short term, then you should do go and do some things, like paying for people to be, create data or something like that. But if you want data in the long term, then you have to go create some community. And sometimes it, there's ways for the foundation to do both and insert itself in a way that makes everyone happy. It's a pretty simple example of top-down versus bottom-up, when to step in and just go do something rather than wait for it to happen. And there's a specific example is, you know, going and fixing design or something like that, um, there's a tension between having just choosing someone to go fix design UX issues or whether you wait for the code to magically appear. And mostly the community and the foundation uh, lean towards the right hand side of this for just a way for stuff to happen. But that means that there's people that are uh, not serviced well by our existing infrastructure. This, this is a tension that um, kind of happens all over the world. In economics, there's, there's a big tension that's very similar between a guy called Hayek and a guy called Keynes. And this guy, that guy, <coughs> was severe in the past. No one smiles. That's the other thing. Trying to find a smiling black and white photo because photo steals your soul or something. Um, he wanted everything to be open and free. He wanted the government to intervene. And if that doesn't make sense, it's a bit like Emacs versus Jim. <laughs> and if that doesn't make sense, it's like Transformers versus Decepticons. That's, that's what we're doing. 
And it, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, it goes to the point where, uh, I'm debating whether to show you this now, but I'm going to. Yeah. It has to be a wrap interview. Look at that. There's a King versus Hayek rap. It's actually produced quite well. Freddy. Hank. Hey, listen, party at the Fed. All right, 20 minutes. Lobby. John Maynard King. Uh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, we're opposed. We oppose each other philosophically in the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer I want them set free. There's a woman bus cycle and good reason to fear it. Like a witch was right. It's an animal spirit. John Maynard Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's off track. Depression, recession. Now your question's in session. Have a seat and I'll school you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it turns out there's a lot of history between these kind of bottom-up and top-down things, and you can go watch that uh, rap if you want, seven and a half minutes long, and, uh, you know, dead economists, wow. <laughs> so, uh, OpenStreetMap, the way the foundation set up, and if the, the concentration on uh, community and waiting for things to happen, all that simply means that, is that there's a section of people that aren't serviced by uh, what the foundation is trying to do, and that's fine, it's what the community has decided. Um, but in an effort to move on and go do new stuff, I think we have to find a way to help those people too. Um, so I've been talking to a bunch of people about running some kind of commercial users conference that's very uh, focused on helping people who are trying to use OpenStreetMap in a commercial setting. One of the things, I, I spend a lot of time dealing with people who want to switch to OpenStreetMap in all kinds of different circumstances, both large organizations and small, both for-profit and non-profit. And the, the conversation is always very similar. It's, hey Steve, you know, we'd love to use OpenStreetMap, um, but please don't tell anybody that we're going to do that because we have a relationship with our existing data supplier who might get very upset. And by the way, could you tell us who else is in a similar position? But please don't tell them. <laughs> okay, so I have these conversations all the time and it would be great just to get all of those people in a room very simply, um, and allow them to talk about what opportunities they face, what challenges they face, and a lot of it is very similar, and give them a space to see what each other are doing. Because a lot of these organizations are able to contribute to OpenStreetMap in a meaningful way, as long as they're able to go public about it in some sense, but they all have different things to contribute, right? Whether it's specific types of data, or people, or processing, or <coughs> money, or whatever. And there isn't really, right now, a way to, be able to do that uh, in a way which maintains the um, quietness that they need to step around their existing data supplies. So, you can go to rsmcuc.com, and I couldn't think of a better name, someone please help me. Um, and you can sign up there right now. So, sometime in 2013, it's 2012 at the moment, right? It's been a long year. So next year, um, you can sign up there, and there's a short little form to ask who you are, when you think it should be, where you think it should be, um, and what we should talk about. There's also a big space, I think, for training, which might be a part of that. At the moment, if you want to learn about OpenStreetMap, it's pretty hard. Um, the idea of, you know, go, go to the mailing list or go read the wiki or something like that. There's some nice uh, stuff on the side, but it's still tough. So that's one thing I'm going to push on and do. I hope that out of that, even more people will switch to OpenStreetMap. Um, you know, I was talking to a designer at Microsoft where I work, and he was saying, Steve, don't put anything near the margin, and I now believe him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand. The, the, I mean, there literally is not a mapping company in the world now that doesn't use OpenStreetMap in some capacity or have some people working on some form of it. Um, and that's, that's down in no small part to a lot of our community volunteers doing things like this, switch to OpenStreetMap website, and which I have some friends put together um, to create resources that allow a smoother transition other than, hey, just go read this book or go read the wiki. Uh, th there's too many to list, especially this year. So I'm going to just point to big ones. Craigslist is, of course, a fantastic use for OpenStreetMap. Uh, the Knight Foundation's recent uh, 
grants, development seeds, work on open street map stuff, $575,000 was it? That one's not in one. Yes, that's a big amount of money. So, um, it's fantastic. I mean, it's all just more confirmation as well as uh, these guys using open street map in different bits of the world. Even if these are the hardest people to communicate with ever. <laughs> <laughs> The other half of that conversation that I have uh, with people about switching to OpenStreetMap is when is the addressing going to be finished? And if there's one thing you need to walk away from here with, um, it's Steve says we should work on addressing. And it's how and why and when, well no, not why, how and when, uh, I don't know. But addressing is the blocker for what we're doing. Um, it's what is still keeping us the underdog um, even even underdog wants you to do addressing. <laughs> <laughs> There's an actual movie called Underdog. Did you know this? Yeah. This is Underdog from the movie Underdog. <laughs> um, very interested in addressing and mapping. Why <laughs> around the city? Um, OpenStreetMap is a fantastic display map. We won. Congratulations! Yay! We are a fantastic display map. It works. We are a fantastic routable map. This routing stuff, you know, it mostly works. Data quality is an issue. But luckily for routing, there's a long tail of data quality. A lot of routes, I hesitate to say four wall, but a lot of routes basically are, uh, you start somewhere, and you get on the freeway, then you go along the freeway, then you get off the freeway, right? So there are certain intersections that are incredibly important. When you get off the freeway into San Francisco, you can turn, you can't turn, forgive me, off the 101 right onto Market Street. If you get that one turn restriction down, Almost all routes in and out of the city now work very, very well, right? So there's these few pain points that you have to do. There's a very small data set. So what I'm trying to get across is to make a routable map in OpenStreetMap, there are these large-scale tools we can use to process the data to check that everything's connected. And the stuff we have to fix is actually relatively small. We don't have to go and fix every intersection. If you can find those important turn restrictions and speed limits that impact a lot of people, you can very quickly make reasonable routes, which look just as good as any proprietary map. The problem is the address. The problem is that to create a commercial or, more importantly, consumer mapping solution around OpenStreetMap, you need address data. Because you need to get that initial latitude and longitude and the destination, more importantly, latitude and longitude, so that the user knows where they are, right? Now, here in the United States, there's a much better story than in the rest of the world. So, us as the US community figuring this stuff out is much easier than the whole rest of the world. We have Tiger data. Tiger has some questionable address range data which we can import. There's parcel data, there's various local government data that we can do. Out in other countries it's much, much, much higher. So what I'm asking is you go do some addressing and if you're writing software you figure out some tools to help us import large chunks of addressing, which is non-trivial, taking Tiger data from 2010 and conflating it against OpenStreetMap 2013 because the roads are in different places and so on. But with that, I mean, there's no longer any barriers to people going and using OpenStreetMap. It's like there are all these people stuck on a cliff, all ready to make the leap. Lemmings is not the image I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people willing to push on with OpenStreetMap, but addressing is stopping. It is the main thing. And a lot of them would like to contribute addressing in some kind of way, so long as everybody else does, and hence creating some kind of forum for them to all talk to each other is important. Um, and we'll no longer be the underdog after that. There's an underdog movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a trade-off that we're going to change once we have addressing, right? Right now, the, the conversations from proprietary map vendors talking to people who say, hey, we're just going to use OpenStreetMap. You know, they're a bunch of clowns, they're hippies, the data quality isn't very good, blah, blah, blah. And most of that is just pure uncertainty and doubt, but the addressing stuff is the one thing that will tip this balance. Um, I've talked about this stuff before. Uh, the OpenStreetMap works because it's a very fast loop. We're faster than those proprietary mappers. You can um, you can win in some sense if you have a faster iteration cycle than your competitors. And our iteration cycle is far faster than proprietary map vendors. One way to model a cycle is to observe something, orient yourself based on that system, decide what to do, and then act on it. Then go back to the beginning. It was a system set up by this guy called John Boyd. And a naive loop looks a bit like that. So you go out, you observe a change in the map, you decide to go and make um, some 
measurements, you come back, you add it to the map, and then you go back and we have this loop in OpenStreetMap of fixing everything that's very tight. It's not as simple as, a, as that, there's a lot of complexity because there's people uh, helping your loop, you might just collect the GPS data and then someone else goes and creates vectors on top of that. But the idea is you, if you have some variable that is changing over time and you have a long loop time represented by those arrows, then you can only make so many decent measurements and you miss a lot of fidelity in detail. If you can shorten the cycle and track much more in depth like that, it makes your, your map better than the competition's. And that I like to represent um, as another form of loop, our loop being much more tighter than proprietary map vendors. Um, skip to that. The map is changing continuously in the middle. You know, I keep having these conversations with people about measuring map quality and trying to explain that the map changes all the time. And there is no one map which is uh, the best that you can compare to. We have a very tight loop around uh, the changes that happen in the world because of you, the volunteers, to go out and map. Um, other crowdsourced systems like MapMaker have, are less tightly coupled because they have a bunch of barriers to entry to checking that data. And then way out in Pluto at the edge of the solar system, the, there's that loop of proprietary map vendors driving cars around. Um, but driving cars is really expensive and they don't do it as much as they used to, which makes our map fundamentally better. This is another one you might not have seen that I was asked to put in. If you plot maps on a graph of price and quality, price, I'm leaving open-ended to quality, I'm also leaving open-ended. Then it used to be that OpenStreetMap was at the bottom left of that graph because the cost slash price of OpenStreetMap was zero, it's freely available. The quality, whatever you want to call that, was also questionable. But as time goes on, it gets better. On the other end of the scale at the top right, you've got proprietary map vendors who are very expensive, but also very complete for some definition of complete. And as time goes on, you know, OpenStreetMap moves to the right, which means those guys have to come down somehow. We need to update this because once addressing has happened, we must, like, have some kind of meteor hitting that and burns down the flames. And, 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 it's an interesting way to think about it. Licensing. Who wants to talk about licensing? There's one guy. There's always one. Okay. So why was Creative Commons chosen? I was asking, you know, Steve, maybe not everybody knows that. Creative Commons was chosen because everybody else used it, primarily in 2004 when I started the project. I had the philosophy then, and there isn't any data to prove this either way that I'm aware of, but that uh, forcing people to give back the changes was the best way to accelerate the project. Um, there is some counter evidence that actually if you just make everything public domain, that works too. But there's nothing compelling. There's no actual data that I've seen that proves it either way. So the first one was to force people to give back because I figured, hey, if we're putting some stuff out there and we force people to give back, we're, we're all on the same page here. Um, and we're leveling the expectations of what goes in and goes out of that project. There was a strong history behind that license. Wikipedia used it. All kinds of people, Larry Lessig flew around the world telling people how great it was. Um, and I also didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to have the jigsaw problem. Now what I mean by that is I didn't want OpenStreetMap to work on all the hard stuff, like mapping all the unmonetizable parts of the world, or the difficult to map parts of the world, like the countryside in Washington State, and then have a proprietary map vendor go and just do Seattle and Tacoma, and take all our work, put in theirs, and then resell it on at some value without us getting any value back. So I wanted you to either take the whole thing or don't take it at all. I'm not really, you know, some partial thing I didn't think was best for all of us. As time went on, it turned out CC Creative Commons wasn't uh, particularly suited to us for a number of reasons. The first is that it was grounded only in copyright, which meant that if that fell apart, if, if maps were found to be databases of fact with no subsistent copyright or other IP rights, then it would mean that anyone could do whatever they wanted with the map and the license would be null and void. So the open database license adds two more things. It turns it into a more <coughs> license under contract. And it also clarifies use cases. Creative Commons is fantastic for pictures and books, but it's more difficult to make it extend to maps because a map is both data plus it's uh, cartography and it's a system around that. So we want to make it more clear that your cartography might be great and also separable from the data that we're providing you. Um, and we actually moved APR this year. Yay. <laughs> Come on, let's clap, please. <laughs> uh, so that's 
that's all in the past, which makes it all much clearer. Uh, but it's not just a data set, right? OpenStreetMap isn't just a data set with a license attached. There's a whole bunch of people behind that. And it's really important to stress that um, there's you know, a, a letter reading of that license, but there's also all the people behind it and how they feel about it and the work they do to make it happen. Ready for my next billion dollar idea? Yeah. 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 Now you know plane crashes, right? The tail always survives in plane crashes. You know this is <laughs> seriously. Look, turn, look, tail. Air France in the Pacific, the tail survived, right? So here's my billion dollar idea. We're going to take the tail of the plane and we're going to allow seating in the back. <laughs> it's not set. Okay. And we'll charge extra and we'll patent this, maybe special seats and stuff. <laughs> More ideas. Something a bit more down to earth. I'm almost finished. So a little while ago, uh, Tom Cardin and I made these uh, large posters using GPS data of London. We got this from a courier company. And we made these animations uh, using this GPS trace data. So these were people driving or biking or motorbiking around with a phone with GPS on it, um, way before the iPhone, very advanced at its time. This is London, you can see the, the Thames going through, and there's a couple of parks, and the thickness of those lines, you see some of them are thicker than others, is because lots of traces uh, on top of each other that are sort of slightly overlapping as people took the roads at different times. And this is one day's worth of data. So people keep on occasionally that once a month they'll get someone asking if they can buy one of these posters, which we sold, I think, for £10 each. It was completely ridiculous. Um, to raise money for, we actually put all the money into OpenStreetMap probably bought us a GPS or something uh, back in 2006, I think, that's what I was not going to run. It would be really nice if we could do this for everywhere in the world, um, where the world is in the United States. So, <laughs> I managed to get GPS data, and again, I, you know, this is really washed out, I'm sorry, but I got GPS data for the United States, and uh, I'm producing these, these posters, and this is the multi-million dollar idea. This is the uh, Puget Sound, this is Seattle. Anyone guess where this is? Portland. That's really washed out. Turns out 1024 by 768 is not a good way to show this. Um, similarly, the Bay Area. And then, can you guess where that is? Chicago. Yeah, I love this one because it's just so contrast with the, the water. Um, even if you have to do some processing to remove the trails in the water. <laughs> Anyone know where that is? Phoenix. Um, hopefully this will make it a bit, bit clearer. When you zoom in, you get these little nice little trails, right? These little, um, every black line represents a GPS trace of someone going around. And there's some fidelity. So as a piece of art, it works really well because from a distance you can see this city and then you can get close to it and investigate the details. Um, and what I want to do is show you some actual posters. Do you want to help? Yeah. Thank you. So that's, that's San Francisco. And uh, come up and have a look at it. These prints are very hard to make, believe it or not. Um, the paper is expensive. The uh, <laughs> printing and the ink is very expensive. And you have to do multiple iterations of these to try and get the combinations right. And I've got three here. There's uh, the Bay Area, I've got Portland, and the Puget Sound. So all left, uh, left-hand side of the country. Um, and my plan with this, and this is my multi-billion idea, which we're going to sign up for, is to do either a Kickstarter or something else so that you can buy these. But warning, you know, these prints, uh, they cost quite a bit to make. But come up and have a look at them. And that's it. Thank you.